Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I believe you can hear me. It's so nice to see such a big Zoom audience. And we've got a lot of people in the room. It's so nice to be back. Okay, everybody. Oops, get Stephen to shut up. <laughs> yeah, just saying welcome and so nice to be back in real life. Um, quick housekeeping rules for those in the room. Last service at 8.30, got to be out of here by 9. Kitchen closes at 8. If you want to order something, um, Jordan will bring you the snack platter. That's about it. I'm very excited for tonight. Um, with Chais and Atumbu, who will come in later on the Zoom. Um, I think Chais can talk. And then if you've got questions for him directly, just ask. Um, put up your hand or whatever you do. And then Atumbu, the same. So we'll try and keep them to half an hour each. Is that okay? Yeah, and we'll just see how it goes. Whatever, yeah, whatever happens. All right, enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Here's your chance. Thank you. Um, we luckily we have Debbie in the room. She's in charge of the IT. Um, she, she's leaving later on, and I'm in charge. So good luck with that. Um, just um, just in terms of what clear. Yeah, we are. Just something in terms of what Claire is saying, and just by the way, we are recording this session, is that um, for everyone online, we can't hear you because of, of, of the mic. So if you have questions, you can just pop it into the, into the chat. Thank you. Anyway, good evening, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Claire, for, for the invite. Like, really, thanks. You know, it's a, as if we don't have enough to do. <laughs> um, so now it's lovely to be here. I, I love this forum. And, and like always, let's keep it uh, informal and, and interactive. And Quentin already asked, you know, where's the for crowd and the against crowd? And like, you know, don't start with that. Um, anyway, I usually have, um, have paper notes, but um, especially at this forum, especially you, you young lot come here with your notes on the cell phone. So I'm going to try that tonight. I'm going to try to be cool. So uh, let's, let's, let's see if it works. So um, when Claire asked me, you know, to come and chat and, you know, and, and I, um, I've always seen this forum as a bit of a, of a conversation start, you know, so um, I don't think the idea is to keep it vanilla, um, you know, let's, let's really um, prompt in terms of, 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 of the way we think and, and um, you know, I, I love how we can, can differ on this forum and, and that is constructive. So um, when Claire asked me and I, you know, I sat down and I, I, I dotted down a few, few notes and, and, and the first notes you've received, I said, tourism, tourism is everybody's business, the old cliche. But what is tourism? We can look at it one dimensional as merely an economic industry, but I prefer much wider, a holistic perspective. Tourism is how we show the world who and what we are as a country and as a people. Um, in my view, tourism is therefore personal. It is a reflection of who I am, of who you are. Um, and what is the impact of this, of this view on our social contract as Namibians? I'll quickly give you a, 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 a quick update in terms of, of the status of tourism. I can't speak on behalf of the whole industry, but you know, we are all very connected and it's not great. Um, unfortunately, with the third wave of COVID, um, you know, we've, we've, we are very seasonal and we've lost our season to a large extent. Um, we're still hopeful for the next two months, but um, it's really crunch time. Um, and and in, the next, in the next two months, something's got to give. It is, it is as simple as that. Um, we are sober about it, um, but um, we will prevail. Uh, we don't always know how, but we, we will prevail um, from day one. You know, at Pemana, we've, we've said clearly uh, the perimeters out in terms of what we feel is acceptable or not, and we'll stick to that. Um, as, as far as humanly possible, we will stick to that. But that's not why I'm here tonight, to come and stand here to talk about something that we are living, you know, 24 hours a day with my colleagues here. They can vouch for that. Um, or to feel sorry for myself, um, we, will, we, will, we will get through this. Um, let us talk about the future of tourism. And I think this has been well, well discussed and well reported that there's a, there's a very strong view that, that Namibia is very well positioned for the way that tourism is changing and has changed and will change in the future. Um, this pandemic has, has jolted us all to a, to a, to a, to a stop 
in, in our lives. And um, I think priorities have changed. So to travel, to, to have life experiences um, are, are higher up on the, on the priority list. And the word is experiences. It's not to go to, you know, to big European cities that necessary and to tick the box in terms of seeing the Eiffel Tower, seeing the Louvre. It is about wide open spaces. It's about solitude. Um, it is about untouched nature. It is about what this country has to offer. So we are, we are well positioned. We are well positioned for the way we see tourism um, in, the, in the future. Um, but I believe, you know, back to what I said in the beginning, that there's more to it. In terms of the pandemic, we have a once in a generation, hopefully once in a, in a, in a century opportunity as a nation to, to, to take stock and to ask ourselves a few difficult questions in terms of, of where we are. If we want tourism to come back, um, we want who and what we are to be reflected to them. We have to have a long look in the mirror and ask ourselves a few uncomfortable questions. Our current status as a nation, you know, what are we proud of who and what we are, um, you know, where, where we are? Um, what are the standards that we have set for ourselves? Um, a nation's standards are set by her citizens. It is you and it is me. Um, small things. If we, if we drive in our national parks, well, if we drive out in the streets here, plastic on the streets, rubbish, that is a reflection of who we are. Um, and it starts with the standards that we set for ourselves. I want to share with you an, an experience I had. I once had a, had a lecturer called uh, Professor Julian Son at Stellenbosch. He was quite, he was very outspoken, quite controversial, and I, I loved how he challenged us as students. Um, and we once had a kind of a, a conversation in class. Um, you know, the Son, he's a, he's a colored person, and the whole Son family, and please don't quote me, this is a long time ago, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it like I remember it. The whole Son family, um, you know, from the Cape Flats, and they, all of them, really, they, 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 they just, um, despite, you know, growing up in the, in the, in the, in the harsh, hard time of the ultimate apartheid back then, that one family, family, not one of them, all of them, really rose above their circumstances. And we asked him, why? What, what, what happened? What was different with you? And he told the story, which, which had a massive impact on me. He said, when he was, when they were young, his father sit, sat them down and he said to them, if I ever catch you pissing in the street, I'll kill you. <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, we had a laugh and, and, and then he was, he was serious. Obviously that's one element, but it says so much, you know, in terms of self-respect. And um, no, like I said, there, there is this history, if you, if you see what, 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 what happened to, to that family. Um, so what are those standards that we set for ourselves, that we set for our peers, that we set for our children? And very important, the standards that we set for our leaders in this country. I'm worried because I've, I've come to, to see a, a habit that us as Namibians have developed where things go wrong. We do this, we throw our hands in the oh, government, oh, that useless company. You know, we, we do this and then we, then we walk on. That is a big, big red flashing light in, 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 in my view. Um, it, is, it is so frustrating um, in terms of, if you look at the scale of Namibia's problems, I had a conversation the other evening with, with Mark Daw, um, and then and we came to the conclusion, you know, we spoke about South Africa and how intimidating their problems are. They've got these big problems. And comparatively, if you look at Namibia, our problems are just frustrating because they are so solvable. It is in our hands. 
to solve our problems. If you look at the scale, you know, low cost housing, what they do in South Africa can solve our problems in two years. Um, but it starts by the standards, the way we think. It is the standards and the limitations that we set in our own minds that according to me is, is the biggest problem. And what comes with this, what comes with throwing your hands in the air, you know, it's, it's, almost, a, it's almost a victim mentality. It's, a, oh, it's someone else's fault. I didn't throw that plastic thing, so why must I pick it up? Um, you know, life owes me something. Um, <clears throat> you owe me something. The system owes me something. Government owes me something. And, and that, to me, is a very dangerous mentality. Um, if we want to create a nation, if we want to be a nation, in terms of where tourists come and they see the reflection of who we, what we are in everything around them. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of this. You know, just for the, for the fear of me standing here and preaching to you, I've done this. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, when, the whole, when the whole fish rod thing broke, um, I remember that so vividly. I walked that morning into my office and it was the front page of the, of the Namibian newspaper and I said, nothing will come of this. You know, it's just me throwing my, my hands in the air. And I was blown away by the reaction of Namibians. And I must say, especially the youth. Boy, did the youth you know, show, show me wrong. Um, they were rioting in the streets. They were saying, not under our watch. I mean, the youth, the youth are 60% plus unemployed. And they were the people standing up for the standards. I love that. That gave, me, that, that gave me so much hope. And that started the process also in my life where I, I got to engage with, with amazing people. I'm so glad two of them are here tonight in terms of young entrepreneurs. You know, walking the, the hard road, not the real, not, not, the, not the easy road, not the political connected road. And I'm so proud of, of, of you know, we, we at Gondwana in the, in the toughest of time, we can work together you know, to help that because that is what we need. It is that self-starter mentality. It is that life owes me nothing. You know? Either I get off my ass and I do it myself, um, or we are in trouble. And in terms of these, these standards, let me give you an example. I've, um, you know, I, I got to engage through this crisis a lot with our, with our public workers. Um, and it's been a fascinating journey. I think the first thing that must be said is that to get to know the people in government, because you know, maybe before the past 18 months, I had limited engagement. And from a distance, it's easy to do, to do this. Oh, government's incompetent, government is useless. And then you get to work with these people. And I meet individuals who are brilliant, who are so hard working, working Friday evenings, calling me on a Saturday morning, on a Sunday morning, where is Harvey? Um, you know, it is, it, it's been amazing. And yet, in this, there, are, there were so many, so many failures in terms of the speed of execution. We are at war. It's a pandemic. We need wartime decisions. And the execution is not there. And I came to realize that we set up the system for those individuals to largely fail. It's impossible to make, to execute quick decisions. Um, and it's all of what the chairman of Gondwana, and I think many of you know him as Claire's husband. Um, <laughs> he calls it mindless governance. Mindless governance, where we had to put so many things in place because of things that's gone past wrong in the past, that it's impossible for us to be agile and to be quick. What standards are we holding up? The systems that we've built for the future of our country. I mean, in this process, it is so important. If we, if we want to be part of that, where we say it's not acceptable, we have to hold each other and all of us, our leaders, to a higher standard. It's always about playing the ball and not the man. Um, it is about your intent. And make no mistake, 
it's not it's not only public sector. It's, it's easy to stand up here and, and, and criticize public sector. It is also in private sector. In private sector, it is easier though because we vote with our feet. If we come to Wolf Shack and the BS wall, well, we just don't come back. So it's easier to hold our leaders in private sector accountable. But on the same story, in terms of the systems and structures that we've built, there are risks in private sector. Um, you know, the Steve Woods, mindless governance, um, where we hide behind things like risk and compliance. Nothing can, have quick, can happen quickly. We don't hear the customer voice anymore. We have to challenge standards. And we have to be careful of international standards. And that might sound controversial. Um, it's not about being anti that, but we have to look at those standards and make sure we adapt them for our reality in our country. Because friends, if we become mediocre, it's not our fault. It's no one else's fault. If we accept mediocrity, it is our fault. Let me give you an example that happened to me um, two, three years ago. We took over Palenbach, um, you know, the iconic lost lodge in the Northwest. And before we took Palenbach over, it's probably been there for 40 years. And I think it was on day three or four after we've taken it over. And I got a complaint um, from a lady who said um, that she was very disappointed and there were not echo icons in the rooms and you know every this and the long list of what was wrong and this is just not Gondwana. And I was so offended. You know, that place has been there for 40 years. We've taken it over for four days, and now you criticize us. <laughs> and I came to realize what a massive compliment. What a standard she's holding us to. And I said, what are you complaining about? This is a huge compliment. Because when she walks in there, in her mind, the benchmark is high. Maintain it or increase it. Don't complain a bit about it. And I think in this process, you know, we, we shouldn't turn into a bunch of cards. It is about what will we do to influence the standards? What will we do to hold our leaders, public or private? up to a standard that will be reflective of our hopes and dreams for ourselves, for our nation, and for our children. I'm so glad Quentin is here tonight because, and, and he probably knows what I'm gonna say now. He always talks about this bigotry of the soft bigotry of low expectations. It is not right. It is not right if we go to a government resort or a national park, and things are not acceptable that we go <laughs> soft bigotry of low expectations. Those are our assets. They, those things reflect who we are. Um, and to me, it is, it is about creating that future, you know, the groundswell in terms of what we find as acceptable and not as acceptable. The creativity and the inspiration, again, especially from our, from our, from our youth, um, that is the solution, the entrepreneurship that we see, um, because all of this reflect to when people in the future come and visit us. They still see our beautiful views. Uh, they still come and visit our land, our, our wildlife, our wide open spaces, but they come to a nation and within the first day, they see the standard that's being upheld in terms of everything that we do, in terms of who and what we are, which makes them so much more than tourists. Because tourists become return visitors. Return visitors become friends. Friends become investors. People want to be part of something that's successful. Something want, people want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. People want to become part of something that's inspirational and that's aspirational. So that one day when we get this right, not if we get this right, we can still throw our hands in there. 
to welcome the world back to us and to celebrate the victories because we've held ourselves and our leaders to a highest standard than what has become acceptable today. And that is how we built a brilliant tourism sector, uh, which is a window of the soul of our nation. And frankly, that is how we built, in my humble opinion, a better number of that is all I have. So I would love to, to engage um, any questions. If there are questions online, um, I think I can find them. So. So, so first of all, let, let me say um, um, that has got a, a detrimental impact on tourism because a tourist doesn't come to visit Gondwana or Talene or NWR. Yeah. A tourist come to visit Namibia. Um, it is all part of the of the of the bigger impression of of what they of what they see, um, and you know so much more in terms of 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 the resorts. It's, that's that's our national assets. That's that's in the global iconic Itosha. Um, so so the the hurt is is unfortunately a bit a bit more. Um, what do we do? Let me let me first say what we don't do. We cannot accept it. We cannot throw our hands in the air and say, it's okay. Because if it's okay, then it's okay. Then you must say, it's okay. And then that reflects our standard. So I think that is the first thing. Then the second thing is that we must, you know, again, not, we can just be a car and, and moan about it, but, um, but to come with solutions, to come with offers, and to stick our necks up in conversations. We're such a small nation. I bet the people in front of me have so many ministers' cell phone numbers on their, on their phones. Right? We have to, to reach out and, and talk to these people, not as if they are blind. They know that, but people react to prompts. So any platform that we have as an individual, like I'm doing here tonight, in terms of our small world of, our small sphere of, of influence, to go and to say, what's happening at the moment is not acceptable. How can we help? How can we make it better? Maybe there's an opportunity for a an, for an young entrepreneur in terms of getting in there. But it's all about prompting the system consistently as Namibians, because we're saying the status quo is not acceptable. And I'm throwing the empty room at responsibility. Yeah. That's what one has done and to me so just to, to me the worst of that in, in my engagement you know with with those people is that you sit down and you really engage with them and you find out oh super people really really good people they 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 want to be um, successful they want to work harder but the system has become lazy there's no accountability my friend's not doing it why should i so um would you you by your own words is there a possibility of creating a platform from tourism industry where you Standards and maybe those models like the one you know, 
the, the, the frustration is exactly that. And, 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 and we must create that platform. And let me tell you why. When, when we started this Gondwana drive through vaccination site, um, and we have no money, we, we have time, you know, we have resources, so we can put things together and we can run around and we can, we can do the work, but we don't have the funding. And I pick up the phone and I start making calls to, to private sector friends. And the reaction, the reaction just blew me away. The one thing that is not lacking in this country is the good one. No. The, the, so good, the good will, so we have the need yes. and we have the good will. But somehow we can't get them together. But now we must do it, right? Save it. Save and I think the, the biggest mistake that we've made in the past, and I, I, I firmly include myself in this, is this assembly. You know, this concept of private sector and public sector. Is, that's nonsense. We are a republic. You know, it's our government of the people for the people. Um, so it is us who must stand up and say this is not acceptable. There's no, there's no two tiered system here. It's, it's us, it's ours. And that is why the accountability also lies with us and it ends with us. Uh, again, you know, a nation's standards are set by her citizens. And, and that platform is built on one word, and that's trust. Because I've asked some people, why, why is it so easy? Why did you say yes to us? They said, because we trust you. We're going to bring you these resources, or we're going to pay cash into the Gondwana Care Trust, because we trust you. And the trust has been broken down. And that's exactly the point. Transparency. One hundred percent. Um, I see. I see. Let me just quickly check here. Um, oh, that's a very good point. Mark said, "Can we kindly repeat the questions as we cannot hear them?" <laughs> And Natumbu said something, something similar. Um, I think I think the the the, the, the and, and and please help me if I'm wrong. The, the the essence of the question is is how, how do we do this? How do we how do we create this platform, in terms of 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 um, you know, both in terms of you know, standards if I'm right, but I think more importantly, in terms of um, you know, being part of the solution. Yeah. There's the question, you've already had the answer. So. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. It's too late now, Debbie. Okay. okay, I think if there are no further questions. One more question, right? So, as you understand that there are standards and they are public. So the question is, how, how do we, we understand that there's you know, standards to be about, how do we get our brothers and sisters to understand you know, to get to the same yeah. I think it firmly starts with, again, with you and with the example that you were setting. I'm so glad you are asking that question because I've seen your you know, You just run through closed doors. You don't take no for an answer. Not for me, not for me. You know? um, because you have, you have a vision and you have a drive. And I'm sure, I'm sure you have friends around you that go, oh, if you can do it, I can do it. And, and that is how it is. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a coach. Um, but there's got to be a coach. It has to be a coach. But it's more about the example. It's about the example that you are seeing in terms of the standards that you are holding for yourself. Um, and, and that is attractive. You know, that is infectious. Uh, 
Um, I think it's also worth remembering um, and, and really looking at what is the, like if we want standards, it's just looking at what is we and what is I and what is we deserve as uh, first time. Mm -hmm. I love that. Can I, can I make a comment that um, standards is also about, you know, what, what, what do we deserve? I love that. And, uh, and again, I think it starts with what do we, what do we provide to others? You know, do they deserve your standard and my standard? And then absolutely, um, you know, we, we, we deserve love. Just every, every single um, Namibian you know, in this country deserves so much love. I just want to ask because I mean you said a lot of times this is an attic failure of science. It's not necessarily a failure of existence. But you often use very powerful leaders as individuals to build the systems and the culture of the group with setting that tone. But I would feel that a lot of the, the brightest, most innovative, most influential individuals look at the current system process and they don't want to be a part of it. You might rather want to try to take that. And deal with the bear because they're into that burnout. So, how do you really incentivize these individuals at high level to change the actual data sets? Yeah. 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 It, is, it is a very good question because the question is um, um, you know, the good people would not want to go into a system where there is not that ability um, to execute the product. And, and again, what I, there's a few names popping into my into my head in terms of the people that, that we've you know, engaged with a lot, um, especially the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Health. And it's funny how, it's not funny, it is, it's kind of obvious, but how those individuals, those dynamic individuals who are there, you know, with really the right attitude and working hard, they immediately stand out. Um, but unfortunately, also their the responsibilities become so much more. You know, becoming almost inhumane in terms of what the load that one person must carry. And, and the breakdowns are so are so simple. We, we get we need an urgent decision and we get a, a decision in Florida and we go, well, and then certain that decision is when it's in writing and it ends up on the table for a signature and we wait 10 days for signature. And then you throw your hands in it. And, 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 and that signature fail failed me, but mostly it fails that great individual who made that decision happen for you. Yeah. So I can't tell you how similar this discussion to the one we had yesterday on mining. It's exactly the same discussion. We had a big mining conference yesterday with 300 people from around the world. And this very topic came up. And I was talking on corporate governance and ESG. And I made the assertion that you can only do as well as, as the ceiling provides. And there's this concept in, in uh, sovereign sovereign rating that you can never be as a corporate rated better than your sovereign. And I asked the question, I said, we've got mining companies that are world class, but we've got a mining ministry and state institutions that are a little below that. And I was fairly diplomatic, but it didn't come across. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to ask Chris the same question further. So I, I said, you know, we have the best, I found out yesterday that we have a mine with drones flying underground that are doing the most amazing world-breaking technology. We all talk about Rwanda being the best of all that. We've got it in Libya, the best. And I said to the minister, can we please lift that ceiling? And can you please apply the same principles to your institution? NAMCOR, NAMDIA, Ministry of Mines, so that we can really re reach our potential. Because in mining, like in tourism, we, are, we can be the best in the world. 
he said to me, and, and for the first time, and this is the good news, the minister came across and he said, I agree with you. I agree with you. We've got to rise together. We've got to take the, the levels up and we've got to implement better standards right across because those are the resources and that's what we owe to the people of this country. And I think it's COVID that's done that for us. I think for the first time, there's a bit of humility and it's not government officials saying, you, the private sector, thinks you're the best. They're accepting that the private sector can actually lift the level. You mentioned Mark Dorr. Mark Dorr, from his holiday in Berlin, came in and he told the whole mining sector, 300 global participants, what the private sector, including Gondwana, has done during COVID time. And it blew people away. It simply blew people away. Then he showed photographs of beds as they delivered oxygen to hospitals. They found beds that were just left out there. And there were some, a few, who said, how dare you, in a global audience, expose the inefficiencies of our Ministry of Health because these beds were left there. And the story ended well because Mark and a number of other companies met and they refurbished those beds and they put mattresses and they built field hospitals and they solved the problem. And government came back and said, thank you to the private sector who identified with the crisis that we're in and who led the way because government's got procurement, this and that and that and that and that. It would have taken them a year to solve the problem. The private sector solved the problem, including Gondwana. And, and for the first time, I see this recognition that government is limited in its ability in mining, in tourism, in everything else. And they're saying, can the private sector please come and help us and lift us together? And I think that's our answer. James has been here a few times, Angela has been here a few times. And, and that's the message they give. Government is asking for the private sector to come in and do that. So I'm going to leave you with that question. Are there limits, like I expressed the Minister of Mines yesterday? to how much Gondwana and other world-class companies can do? And, and what are those bottlenecks and constraints that we still need to lift so that we can bring everybody up in a rising tide? Uh, and this is, this is the question around tourism. We talked about it in mining yesterday. I think we've got to the answer. The question is in tourism. What is that? Thanks, Steve. And I think the, I think the first thing is again, you know, I, I, I will start I will start with myself. Um, and and it is the first step is the limitations in our minds. Um, two weeks ago, a colleague of mine told me about a company in Botswana who started an airline flying people directly from Florida to Mars. I laughed. I literally thought he was joking. It's called Kalahari Air. They fly in. Google it. They fly tourists directly from Florida, I think if I'm outside, directly to Mount, to the Okavango Delta. I go, damn it. If they can do that in these times, what's wrong with that? Why can't we fly people directly to Hiroshima? To an international, you know, to an international uh, airport there. Um, so, so it, to answer Steve's question, it is so it is, it is for us, but it's also again for our government. We must be careful to limit our to see our limitations as we need to fix the queer, halal, and number two, and I'll speak specifically about Porsche. What about everything else that we push up? You know, low impact. What about walking tours with low impact, whether it's camping, whatever? We must never, never destroy what we are selling by the way we are selling it. But if we can become creative in terms of what we can offer, um, you know, with that, and that's just one of the countless amazing parts that we have in this country, to be creative. But for that, um, you know, the limitation must be, or the, the first point should be um, that, you know, 
especially our ministry, that we can go to our ministry and come up with these ideas. The problem also with, with these ideas and unsolicited proposals, I think you saw the controversy on the front page this week of the newspaper. And I don't have the answer to what I'm about to say is how do we keep it fair and transparent? Is that oh, when Wana comes up with all these great ideas, and Wana gets all opportunities. Um, or must we box it or you know categorize it in terms of some must be at the top, some must be open to the public, must be a fair process, um, and then but also leave room for those entrepreneurs to come with amazing ideas. Because the future of tourism, the large of the untapped future, the untapped potential of tourism lies in, 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 our, in our national, not in private. It's, it's, it's in the parks, all the parks around the country. Um, Claire is, is, is pointing me. I'm just quickly going to um, a question from Sandwich Team first. As mentioned, the systems in place in English need to be looked at. New country systems in place. Um, do the current systems in tourism allow youth to join? Do they help the upcoming companies? Um, there have been several concerns raised about the structures in the industry. Uh, where has there been where has there been no discussion around those issues that concern the medium, smaller companies in the in the industry? Um, then a second one: um, How does Kavana start in their own tours, which directly compete with the Namibian companies that worked with them in the past, help the industry? It is not detrimental to the this is not detrimental to the talent growth of the market. How does someone compete when Vandana does their own rentals, tours, accommodation, and entire package? No one can compete with that. We as tour providers are now suffering because of that. How can a new company start tours against that back? This is a very important um, case. How is the relationship of businesses and tourism with the Namibian tourism board? How closely does it be with the industry? As the custodian of promotion of food. Okay, can I just quickly spend two minutes on, on, and I'm sorry, we're running out of time, so but I'm, I'm specifically gonna, gonna answer the question. Um, you know, my position is Gondwana. So so Gondwana is, is um, you know, we, we have been for a couple of years run into the value chain you know, in terms of vertical integration. So to become that one stop, we offer car rental, we offer um, to operate here, we offer everything that Guna Safari is. And I've had this question before. I've had this question before. Now you're competing with, you know, with other people in the value chain. And this to me is something that I really feel is very strong. Um, where, where do you draw the line? We can, we can become a nation where we say, Coca Cola is doing really well. Poor people. Let's force people for every two coach you buy to buy a one pitch. We must understand that in any value chain, whether tourism or otherwise, you have to earn your dollar every day. What is your value add? Just because you earned a dollar yesterday doesn't mean that you, the world owes you that dollar tomorrow. You have to add value every single day. We have amazing young startup companies. Uh, we just worked now with a, with a, with a, um, a young startup company focusing on youth travel. I thought that was great. It's a bespoke market that catered only for that market. A big umbrella can't, cannot compete with it because it's a bespoke, it's a, it's a specialized product. But mainstream tourism is becoming a commodity. Who's going to win? It's, it's, it's about availability and price. I can't go now and say, I'm going to start a gold mine, but you know, the bigger ones can't compete. And of course, that may be a bit harsh, but we must understand that we must earn the dollar that we can. That is where creativity is and, 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 and value add. Otherwise, we would have still be stuck with Kodak and all those people because uh, we can't. You can never limit creativity in competition. 
So they were talking about uh, what happened in the music industry when digital era arrived and these big record companies were still trying to sell CDs and they were blocking all of the uh, pirate uh, websites and they tried all the other ways to, to get rid of a pirate website. And this one guy who started, I think he started Napster, and he tried to speak to them and say, listen guys, let's start something where you have one platform where you can sell all the music, 20 discs, 20,000 discs, on one platform and you have to put them And they refused. And that's where they went under. Now, he says, 20 years later, it's, it's kind of obvious that you only pay one subscription to listen to from rock music to reggae music to local music instead of buying a CD which you only really want one song on. And that's, I think that's what's called is called. People are so reluctant to change and to go with the market and say, okay, the market is changing, how can I tap into that market and sell them something better that they would, if I don't sell them that, then they'll find an illegal way to get that. And I think that also speaks to the we have to adapt to what the market wants. I, I, I love what Quentin said, and let me give you an example then of the which is still to our detriment. Um, it's been coming for a few years, but I was you know, I was confronted at ITB in Germany two years ago, where they said, ah, look at these big bus lodges. Modern tourism doesn't, doesn't matter. They want small, owner run, small places. People want more self tasting options, they want things like that. We will vote for big prices. And then we sit around the table and we say, well, we can unfold this example. We can deny this. No, we will force the market to go. And we will die. So we start building camping together next to our lodges. What happens? Yes, there's an element of cannibalism. Because the people don't stay in the room now, they stay in the cheaper option outside where they, but either you put that or you die. We are working on plans with our big lodges to say, you know, maybe cluster a few rooms together and give them a self touching option, whatever. But you have to move it fast because the market will not wait for any one of them. Even if you're not for them. Okay, now. And, and, I, I, um, and I, would, I would love to offline and be not surprised, engage with you. Our doors always open, and I think I'll check record in terms of cooperation working together with others. If it makes sense. Um, speaks for itself. But um, now we we are in for the highlight of the evening. <laughs> so Natubo, if you can um, unmute and and and, and, um, and start your video. So Good evening, everybody that's um, following us online, virtually. Thank you so much, Claire, for the invite. I'm very honored to be here. Um, the last time I was in touch with uh, some of the 29ers was about sometime last year. Most of you may remember me for, uh, or you know me for my um, organic uh, manufacturing business. But I wear so many hats. Um, so when people ask me, so what do you do? You know, my favorite line is I operated people and nature spaces. So uh, that's what I do. So I just want to give um, a brief introduction of who I am for people that may not know Netumbo Velile Nashandi. I'm 42 years old. I've been very passionate about tourism since a very, very young age. I grew up traveling um, around the world uh, because of my parents' work. And um, I just like to, to meet and interact. Is, is everything okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we just, just wait. Yeah, we're just trying to fix the sound. Sorry. The view, how, how do we change the view? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please myself? 
Can you hear me? Okay, I can even hear my echo. Fantastic. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So good evening, fellow 29ers and fellow non 29ers. Thank you so much, um, everybody for joining us. Um, Claire, thank you very much for the invite. Um, I'm excited to share my thoughts on intra-Africa travel with um, everybody joining us online and, and everyone present. I'm going to be as informal as possible because that's the, the, the joy of, of being a 29er. You know, we, don't, we try to be as casual and as informed as possible. So just a bit of background about myself for people that um, may not know who Netumbo Velile Nashandi is. Um, most of you guys on the 29ers uh, may remember me from the last time I was there, sometime last year, I think. Um, and you all know me for my, um, for my uh, organic soil uh, manufacturing business. I, I invented a cream that cures eczema and so forth, but COVID has just derailed all of our operations. Um, we're slow coaching in that regard. Um, I grew up traveling. I grew up uh, with amongst different cultures um, in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. I'm a half uh, Ondonga, Namibian, and a half Ndebele, Zimbabwean. Um, when people ask me, so what do you do, Netumbo? Um, I struggle to place myself in a box. So the thing that really fits with me um, is to say that I operate in people and nature spaces. So I'm going to uh, share a bit of um, my thoughts on intra-Africa travel with you all. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and let's pick it up from there. Just give me one second. Here's the share screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Face, can you please help me out? Or oh, Debbie, could you please enable the screen sharing option so I can... Um, share my presentation with you all as I'm speaking. Okay, I'm the co-host now. Thank you, Debbie. There we go. Okay, so we are sharing my screen now. You can see um, intra-Africa travel. Start slideshow. There we go. Okay, so what is intra-Africa travel? Why is it important? I'm so sorry, guys. I'm getting challenged by technology for a second. Okay, here we go. So intra-Africa travel. Why is it important for Namibia? The pandemic has illustrated the need for diversification. The pandemic has also illustrated that um, we need to find ways of mitigating uh, travel barriers that, that have been instigated by the COVID, uh, this COVID. Why is intra-Africa travel for Namibia? Uh, we need to see how we can tap Namibia into the AFTA narrative. Namibia is a signatory to the, to the, to the, to the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And I'm also going to speak on the MEFT arrival statistics of 2020 and why these will also illustrate to you why it is important for Namibia to intentionally and actively um, focus on intra-Africa travel. I'll also speak on creative and collaborative initiatives. So why Africa? The ministry, our Minister of Environment and Tourism um, released the latest uh, uh, um, arrival statistics. If I'm not mistaken, it was around the mid, middle of last month. So what you're looking at is, uh, is directly sourced from MEFT's arrival statistics. 
you can see on here that 66.1% uh, of arrivals to Namibia um, in 2020 are from the African continent and 26.8% of our arrivals are from the European continent and 3.3% uh, are from North America and Asia respectively. Now in 2019, we had similar stats. I don't have a visual to share with you, but I sort of know, know them by heart. Um, uh, MEFT uh, uh, tabulated that we received about 70, between 76 and 79% of our arrivals were from the African continent. Some in the tourism industry may argue, but you know, most, of, most of, uh, of these arrivals are people that come in for shopping, uh, specifically the Angolan market, because it used to be our largest um, uh, 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 African uh, uh, traveler contributor. We've got a lot of traders that come in um, in the Northwestern parts um, of our country from Zimbabwe. Zambia, uh, Natumbo, I think the internet's having a problem. Natumbo, can you hear us? In in the economic sector. Natumbo, can you maybe just turn off your video? Oh, we've lost her. I think she's dropped off. No, I think she's just having internet issues, so we'll just wait for it to come back on. But I'm handing over to you as an <laughs> Okay, let's try this again. Can you switch off my uh, my video? Yes, I can. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, um, let's just see if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, oh, hold on. Stop video. Okay, perfect. Cool. Perfect. So, Get where did on. you stop hearing me? At what point? Okay. On this slide. Yes, why Africa? Okay. okay. Yeah. Why Africa? Why Africa? Um, this map is sourced from MEFT's um, arrival statistics, uh, 2020 arrival statistics that were released mid-August uh, sometime. Uh, this picture illustrates that 66.1% of arrivals to Namibia were from the African continent. Now, if we had to compare that with uh, last year, the 2019's arrival statistics, those illustrate that 76% of arrivals to Namibia are from the African continent. Now this shows a trend and, and I'm of the belief that uh, we, we are best advised to use statistics to inform our strategies moving forward. Now, 66% of these arrivals coming from the African continent um, it also show that um, we have a lot of interest to Namibia from fellow Africans. Angolan markets in 2019 uh, proved to be the largest uh, uh, group of African visitors to Namibia, closely followed by South Africans. Now, as I doing a brief introduction about my vice versa from other African countries seemingly have no idea of where Namibia is. I had to take the time and moment to sort of use South Africa as a benchmark and ask them, so have you heard of Nelson Mandela? Yes, okay. 
Have you heard of Angola or Jonas Savimbi? Yes. Okay, so Namibia is that little country nestled between, not, not so little, by the way, I'm just using that um, uh, as, a, as a term, but Namibia is that country that's nestled between Angola and South Africa. And then you would get a aha, you know, people start recognizing what Namib where Namibia is located. So that's really um, annoyed and frustrated me in that how is it possible that fellow Africans cannot know anything about Namibia? And then it illustrated to me that um, we have been uh, uh, actively or intentionally, you know, um, built, but African countries. Now, moving on to the next slide, Namibia is rising. Some of you may know of Wodemaya, a Ghanaian uh, travel blogger. He was in Namibia uh, last month or two months ago. So these are the things that he's posting about Namibia online. These are the things that fellow Africans have heard of Namibia. Why do Africans visit Dubai instead of Namibia? 492,000 views. Why Namibia roads are ranked the best roads in Africa? And we've got to relocate to, to, to Africa, specifically to Namibia. So there is a lot of interest um, in the world for Namibia, but I feel like we are not doing enough um, as a country to, we have not been doing enough as a country to, to, um, to, 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 to raise awareness of, of our destination to, to the rest of the continent. Africa also has the youngest median population in the world. You can see there it states that Africa is the youngest continent in the world and presents the highest share of inhabitants age 14 years and younger. What does that mean for a business person, for an, econ for an economist? That means that within the next five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, African young people are going to be the most um, uh, 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 liquid, so they'll have a lot of disposable income. And we need to start planning forward to that time so that they can come and spend all of that disposable income here. We now have easy access to the consumer market on the African continent. Uh, the, 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 the rise of the internet and the availability of cheaper data options have really bridged the gaps that have been abound uh, normally. Normally we'd have to travel to trade shows, you know, and most, um, uh, uh, of our operators in Namibia, for instance, uh, um, are not um, at that level where they can afford to, to travel to all of these trade shows. So the internet has really helped to bridge that gap. I like speaking about the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement because it, it, I mean, it, it promotes the movement of goods and people, but then we don't really ask ourselves, we don't, put too much attention on how are these goods moving? How is trade going to thrive? Tourism is the, is the catalyst. Tourism is the conduit. Most people travel to a destination first on holiday and then discover the opportunities. Some usually travel with an intention for business, like firsthand, they, they know exactly what they want, but most, most people decide to, to look to, 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 um, to invest in a destination after having come on holiday and so forth. And because the AFTA is promoting the free movement of people and goods, why don't we as a tourism fraternity or, or people that are interested in, in, in tourism take advantage of the, of the, of the policies and, 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 and regulations that are being put into place to allow for such um, uh, 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 um, trade to thrive. Another reason why it's important to put the focus on African travelers is that there, is, there are a lot of African people that have long haul travel hesitancy. We have experienced the same thing here in Namibia where a lot of uh, most members of our society are hesitant to get vaccinated, they're hesitant to travel and so forth. And because Africa is so is easily accessible, we can intentionally take a proactive stance 
and show ourselves to these fellow Africans that have a lot of money. They spend most of their money in Dubai, in Southeast Asia, in North America and so forth. Why don't we um, uh, to, uh, try to woo them to come and, and, and expand all of their disposable income in Namibia? Why are we not doing that? There's so much that we could gain out of it. And another thing that is important to consider on why we should put all of our focus on, not all of our focus, intentionally just start wooing African countries to come to Namibia is our travel barriers. We are all aware that um, other countries around the world have started instigating travel passports, COVID passports and so forth. On the African continent, if I'm not mistaken, the African Union has said that um, it is not going to hold any nation uh, on a compulsory um, COVID vaccine stance. So you can still travel within the African continent with a valid PCR test. Some are accepting rapid antigen tests. So why are we not taking advantage of that? There are so many of our operators that are used to receiving visitors from our traditional source markets, which have been the, 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 the bedrock, the, the foundation of our tourism sector over the past 30 years. But now we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Are we going to wait until COVID regulations um, are, 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 are okay for Namibians or Africans to, 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 to get comfortable, to start moving around? Are we, are we going to wait around for COVID regulations to, to allow for our traditional guests to come into the country? In, whilst we are waiting, what happens to operators that are dependent on these markets for their livelihoods? What happens to people that have mortgages to pay? What happens to, to people that are just waiting for those bus tours that we're so used to? What's going to happen to them? We've got 54 countries on the African continent that consider Namibia as the Switzerland of Africa. You saw the illustrations that I, that I, that I showed you um, from Wodemeyer what, what, what uh, the number of views that um, th those videos that he, he's made are, are enjoying. So there's a huge put up, uh, opportunity, there's a huge potential that we could tap into and we could allow for Namibia to have a diversified pool of guests from around the world. And the tourism pie is so big, you know, so everybody could have a piece of that cake. There's also, like I've been saying, the need for diversification. You know, and I also mentioned traditionally we spent millions of dollars market on marketing activities on other continents. We could also divert our attention to some of these uh, these countries. There's a myth around the world, or uh, there's a myth, and I'll speak to the Namibian tourism sector specifically that Africans cannot afford to travel to Namibia. That myth. Um, should be dispelled intentionally. We know people that can afford uh, to travel to Namibia. We know pe uh, people that have desires and strong wishes to travel to Namibia. Unfortunately, we do have um, uh, travel barriers. You know, we don't have that easy access, uh, that, that easy air access that we used to enjoy, especially now that um, our national airline has been liquidated. We are dependent on, um, on, uh, on, on foreign airlines to, to bring our guests in. We're so blessed to have West Air still operational. Uh, so yay for us, you know. Another need for diversification, and I just, I need to touch on this. Um, I've, I have it on very, very, very good authority that the film industry of Namibia has a huge potential to save our tourism industry in some instances where we are in our, so in our dry, dry low season. There's a production currently ongoing in the country that has employed 1,624 Namibians over the past two months, spent over 200,000 on flight tickets alone, spent over Three million Namibian dollars just over the past two months on accommodation facilities. So they, they and so if these international film um, uh, producers see this potential in Namibia and they're bringing in so many millions to into our tourism economy when we desperately need it, 
why are why would we expect that other African countries do also do other African uh, travelers uh, do not have the similar desire to come and see the beauty that Namibia has to offer? So on creative and collaborative initiatives, um, I just want to give a an example of what uh, creativity and col collaboration can bring to the table. Last month, um, we're going September now, so no, not last month. In June um, 2021, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism hosted a, a UNWTO a Strengthening Brand Africa conference. And uh, this is where this DRC exploratory visit was birthed. So in this picture, I'm pointing at our Namibian ambassador, who's based in the DRC, His Excellency uh, Simeon Ulenga. And next to him is the DRC Tourism Minister, Honorable Nsimba. And uh, here is Madame Jolie Yombe, who is the CEO of the uh, Office National du Tourisme, which translates to um, National Office of Tourism of the DRC. And next to her, we've got uh, Faustin, Kapasula, who is a representative of ITEA. And next to me, we have Mr. Ali Kairarua, who is a representative from Han. And next to him, we've got Ms. Elaine Mengeri, who is um, our, our, our attache at our embassy in DRC. So what happened here is that um, at that UNWTO conference, we had some very interesting conversations, uh, you know, regarding how can we strengthen brand Africa? How can Africans take charge of the narrative of this, their story? How can Africa as a continent come together and bring travelers back in the midst of this pandemic that has brought so many people's livelihoods to, 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 to their knees, to our knees, you know? Our, I mean, I'm part of the, I'm part of the, the sector. So that's where this idea was birthed out of. Um, it's, it's out of this world. We were just talking with uh, the, um, the delegates from the DRC and we thought, why not? Let, let us go and see what the DRC has to have, has to offer. So DRC has 87 million inhabitants. Um, they were inspired by the Namibian tourism story because compared to their 87 million population, to our two point, almost 2.6 population, they received just 200,000 tourists in 2019, whereas we received about 1.6. They were so in awe and so fascinated that how did you guys do it? What is going on? Could you please come and, and, ill and illustrate to us, uh, come and see our products, come and help us develop our tourism industry? I know that most of you in the audience are sitting there thinking, may, oh, not most of you, I sh shouldn't be assumptive, but most of you may be thinking that how does the FENATA uh, chair and delegation go to the DRC to, to help them with their tourism sector when we've got so much um, crap in inverted commas going on in our tourism sector for lack of for a better term where we've got so much drama and uh, and 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 um, and uh, we're, we're not stable we've got infighting and with our structures are um, could do better you know there's a lot that can be done to strengthen Fenata and so forth yes um, I acknowledge all of these things. They are real issues that are happening. And I saw most of the questions that were addressed to Chais earlier. Um, uh, you know, we can address them later in the Q&A session. But yes, we are aware that we've got all of these issues, but we are an inspiration regardless to the rest of Africa. Um, our, our road infrastructure works. Uh, we are happy individuals. We are such a tiny population, yet, yet we manage to, we still manage to get it together to bring in so many tourists. So, so that is how this um, idea was birthed. Um, the, the delegates uh, asked us, you know, can you come and spend some time with us? We'll just talk, take a tour around uh, the, uh, the Congo Central, um, see what we have to offer. And wow, um, the Congo, the DRC is a beautiful, untapped, virgin territory. Everything could be up for grabs. 
from tourism to farming to mineral resources to training. So the idea that we have, and um, it's, it's taking shape very well, was that on the backs of the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement, on that narrative, how can we take advantage of that narrative? How can we use that to grow and bring more opportunity for Namibian tourism entrepreneurs, which has now domino affected to any sector because the DRC literally has everything. To have Namibian businesses set up in the DRC and vice versa, and in that process, have a skills sharing, uh, JV opportunities. There's so much stuff that can happen. And um, lucky for us, um, the, the minister on the other side is fully um, supportive. Uh, they're, all, they're all ready to come to the party. So they, they, there's so much that we, we, we can learn from this, um, from this first exploratory visit that other African nations are really ready to engage. They look to Namibia as a benchmark, as a success story. We are revered in, in those tourism spaces even though we've got a lot of, of our own laundry to clean up in our backyard and so forth. And um, just exploring that reciprocity, you know, why are we not building on, on this opportunity to really hold hands uh, in the true Ubuntu spirit and, and get and help to bring uh, the, our tourism economy back on track whilst uh, 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 engaging and, um, and creating conducive um, platforms for African travelers to come to Namibia and the rest of the world. We're not saying we're, I'm not, I'm, I'm not even thinking, I'm not, we're not saying we're, we're not interested in everyone else. We're saying let, let's put a spot, let's put an intentional spotlight on, on African countries. Um, I think that that's where I'd like to stop. Um, and I thank you. And that is the end of my presentation. I've got lots of beautiful pictures that we could share, but we have not received them yet from our partners in the DRC. So that's why what you see is uh, just a, a small, a, 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 a small uh, teaser of, of what could be. I thank you. Matumba, wow. Can, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear everybody crystal clear. Thank they you. were clapping, clapping, clapping. <laughs> it was absolutely, again, Clarissa's words, inspirational, aspirational. And um, thank you for those insights as well. And I just want to drop in a book on the group for people to read. I'm looking at Judah Konza. <laughs> it's called Blood. <laughs> it's, it's called Blood River by Tim Butcher about the history of the Congo. And it's absolutely you know, you need to read it if you want to go into the Congo and you know the people and the country and the diversity and the, you know, how it's not working. But yes, I mean, if only we could all go there and they could all come here. Why do we want to go over the sea? Well, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> Just saying. Right. That's me. Right. Old. But yeah. No, but what a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I'm not sure if the questions that have been coming up, um, if they'll be on the recording, so you can answer later. And are there okay. questions here in the room? Are there questions here in the room? Just a thank you. Just a thank you. No Dr. questions? <laughs> Seriously? Um, I know, also exactly. Seriously, no questions, people? <laughs> because that was a very diverse um, look at what's in our faces. You know, we, we ignore so much that's right in front of us. And, and I don't and know how I that happens. If I could just add one more, one more, uh, one more um, point, uh, two more points there. Um, first, with regards to the DRC, and this speaks to a lot of African countries. Uh, when I speak, with, when I have conversations with my friends that are resident in these other African countries or their friends that they've referred to visit Namibia, um, the resounding uh, common denominator amongst all of them is that, wow, what a beauty Namibia is. We are so revered around the world, but I mean, that's how it is, you know, we, we don't, um, 
we don't see ourselves normally unless other people see us from outside, but we really should tap ourselves on the back. Uh, even though we've got a lot of work to do uh, moving forward, um, we are revered. And the film industry, guys, just wow. Just, just wow. I want you guys to all percolate on that and just imagine what a difference we could make when we work together collaboratively almost 2000 jobs created within the space of a month and a half and i'm done speaking there is so much there's so much happening in the film industry my, my, my place husband might come again <laughs> i just I just quickly want to put a personal story in here when i came to work here 40 odd years ago just like namibia why are you going to that hellhole? There were no tourists because no one wanted to come to the desert. Yeah. What do you want to go there for? And how much has changed in that time? It's really interesting to think about mindsets again. Yeah. And then we have got to stand or talk. <laughs> I need to Could you put your cameras on? I'm wonderful. just looking at dark screens, so, if you don't mind. So I can feel present as well. I mean, I'm present in space. Okay. But it would be great to have to see what's going on there. <laughs> Great, thank you. So, so the film industry, Joel, you know very well, and he's obviously involved with this one. And Joel came to us about a year ago and said, have you any idea what the potential is of the film industry? And, and Geis has talked to Joel, and I went immediately to the Minister of Finance and I said, can we at least have short term uh, relaxations on VAT and a few other things so that we can really get more benefit from the film industry. At the same time, Cape Town, which is a sort of Southern African hub of film, came to us and said, can we please get our act together because they overbooked for five years and all of, all of the filming happens in Namibia and then all of the production happens in Cape Town, but they have to turn away one in every two applicants because everybody wants to come here but the cape town capacity is limited so they actually we thought we were their competitors but they said we're completely collaborating with them and we must set it up so i went to nagula and i said can we please have a film act in uh, put through parliament as soon as possible and taking you back 25 years i i, I got the, the irish film act and the New Zealand Film Act and a few others. So I've given them some sort of he headlines on that. And mm -hmm. the minister has said, absolutely, for this present film, we will see what short-term incentives we can give. And then the NIPDB must really create this as a, as a major competitive advantage for Namibia, because everybody absolutely. wants to make their films here. Yeah. But we don't want them to just to make their films here yeah, and employ a thousand odd people for, for a week or two. We want them to do the production and all of that here. So that's that's a big priority at the moment. And and as you say, we can really bring a whole lot of jobs to Namibia. Mad Max and Flight of the Phoenix created massive opportunities for South Africa, although all the filming was done here. And those were big budgets. So we, we literally can talk of billions of of, of revenue for Namibia if we get our act together. So please keep, from a tourism point of view, keep keep championing that. Angula said, absolutely, it's a niche opportunity that we have. It's a competitive advantage. The Minister of Finance has said to me several times, we can make Namibia the haven of, of, of film, as New Zealand did, as Jamaica did, as Ireland did, and many others did. So it can become a big part of our business. So please keep championing that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Again, again, it's all about people talking to each other, communication. We've got to have cohesion here. You, know, you have a bright idea and there's another one there. People keep reinventing the wheel and no one's getting together to make it work. That's your point. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Tumba, that was amazing. Any more questions here? I see there are some questions online here. Duna Safari. Quickly. Quickly, uh, quickly, Dakonja has a question. Yep, so, yes, Dakonja. Uh, it was a responsible BPS Namibia to make Namibia a ticket to travel to, right? Now, how can we as the average Namibia 
um, assist to make it better possible. I just have to first say, you're not an average human being. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you please repeat that? Can you speak louder, if you don't yes, mind? Sir. If you don't mind shouting, that, that would even be better, because I'm squeezing yeah. my earphones into my ear and I'm still struggling. Yes, so I'm saying, right, um, it's our collective responsibility as Namibians to make Namibia as a lucrative place to travel to, right? Now, what yes. can we as average Namibians do um, to contribute to that dream, basically? What can you as Namibians do to contribute to that dream, um, to that vision? Remain, uh, uh, one of the things that you could do is that when you travel to other countries, uh, remain ambassadors for the country and uh, do your part. Like when you see the, 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 the memes uh, selling their curios and arts and crafts in the street, you know, buy, um, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this statement, but rather uh, buy from the informal market um, rather than from the, I shouldn't say rather than from the standalone shops, but I think you guys know what I mean. You know, that, that it's one of the things you can do. You can intentionally support uh, the, 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 the traders that are used to receiving their income from tourists because those numbers have declined drastically. I mean, 87% is a huge drop in, our tourism, uh, no, our tourism arrivals. So that's one of the things you could do. Um, be positive about the country, talk about Namibia. We are all ambassadors of Namibia by default, by virtue of our citizenry, our residency, you know, uh, that's how people learn, learn about Namibia. One of the things that I love doing when I engage with uh, non-Namibians on, on Namibia is I always tell them three things. And this, uh, these three things um, happen in that specific order, you know, and people become curious because they want to see whether they can prove these three points wrong or not. So you could also adopt this if, if, you, if you feel. So the first point is that um, when you're speaking to somebody and they're like, yeah, oh yeah, why should I come to Namibia? What's so special about Namibia? You don't need to go deep into the, the Etosha National Park, Sosius Vley and all of that. Um, you could, if you wanted to, the first point you could say is that the first thing that happens to you when you come to Namibia, you fall in love with the country. And then the second thing that happens when you come to Namibia is that you just, want to prolong your connection to Namibia. You, you, no, 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 you want to prolong your connection to Namibia. You want to come back and set up either a business or you find a lover or a wife or a girlfriend or husband, or you, 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 um, you, you start up something. And the third thing that is definitely going to happen to you when you come to Namibia as a first time visitor is that you want to come back again with somebody close to you so that you can share in that experience. And that's what usually happens. People come here on holiday, they come back with a close friend. And then the third thing is they just want to brainstorm, how can they prolong the connection? What are the business opportunities? Can I buy property? You know, so I hope that helps you a little bit um, without going into the this normal standard narrative uh, because we want to be creative leaders and citizens as opposed to normal modus operandi robots. Thank you. You want to end? Oh. Luchimbo, thank you. Um, oh, yes. No. Case, let Case just wrap up a bit and then we say goodbye. This is being recorded, obviously, and Debbie, the star, will put it online tomorrow on the group and on the Slack. Um, it's been an amazing event. For those who, who haven't been involved tonight, please look at the recording. Face, oh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Tumbu. Um, please let me know when you're back in town. Let's have a coffee. Let's um, do that. I'm, I mean, I'm in Wildest Bay at the moment, everyone. Yeah. Oh, and thank you, and well done with the technology. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, okay. Thanks. Okay, let's end it. Call Thank it you. Night. Thank you Have so good much. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. bye.